Aloha, bienvenue, hoş umadi, dobroa, pojolabit, marhaba, and welcome to our second webinar on cultural heritage and the sustainable development goals. Today, October 17th, is the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. According to the World Bank, the pandemic and the ensuing global recession may cause over 1.4% of the world's population to fall into extreme poverty. In order to address this serious problem, countries will need to prepare for a different economy as they work towards a sustainable and inclusive recovery. It is towards this path of recovery that our second webinar, Economy and Prosperity, Driving Community-Based Sustainable Development Through Cultural Tourism and Employment addresses the ways in which cultural heritage contributes to sustainable development, economic recovery, and a wide range of SDGs, including SDG 1, 4, 5, 8, 12, and 14. Reaffirming the interconnectivity of the SDGs and cultural heritage's contribution to sustainable development across its various dimensions. We're delighted that you can join us today. My name is Linda Shatabi. I'm a member of ICOMOS Sustainable Development Group's Working Group, focusing on heritage policy and environmental sustainability. And together with Fatiha Pollen, CEO of Perceive Research and Design and the SDG Working Group's Focal Point from ICOMOS Bangladesh will be moderating this webinar. We have one, three wonderful speakers today, all members of ICOMOS's Sustainable Development Goals Working Groups, each discussing case studies that showcase the contribution of cultural heritage in alleviating poverty and inequalities by supporting economic development through sustainable tourism that protects natural resources. Our first speaker is Fergus McLaren, who with 25 years of experience in sustainable tourism and cultural heritage management in Canada and internationally, is currently engaged with tourism at World Heritage Sites and the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. In addition to being a practitioner, he has lectured on sustainable tourism in North America, Asia, and Africa, and his work is published widely. He currently acts as the Director of International Relations and Knowledge Management for the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa. Additionally, he performs in an expert capacity for the Organization of World Heritage Cities and United Nations World Tourism Organization and sits on UNESCO's World Heritage Focus Task Group on Cultural culture, tourism, and COVID-19. Our next speaker, Larry Copen, founder and executive director of the Sustainable Preservation Initiative, a capacity building and economic development nonprofit organization that provides sustainable business and entrepreneurial opportunities to communities near endangered archaeological sites, empowering disadvantaged entrepreneurs and artisans, a majority of whom are women, by providing basic business education and tools to build the future they want for themselves, their families, and their communities. Larry is an archaeologist archaeologist and a consulting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, with recent publications on the archaeology of performance, theater, power, and community. 
Larry is an expert member of the APOMOS International Scientific Committee on Archaeological Heritage Management and a former trustee of the Archaeological Institute of America. Our third speaker is Pankaj Manchanda, founder and CEO of Odd Traveler, an augmented reality-based multimedia app for cultural heritage tourism based in India. The platform uses augmented reality, geofencing, and multimedia to enhance the visitor's experience at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in India, with plans to expand visitor experiences to the top 100 World Heritage Sites globally. Our Traveler has been a well-recognized startup by the government of India and has been nominated as one of the top most innovative and promising startups in the travel tech domain by the Ministry of Tourism and Invest India. Pankaj's background has been in education, technology and business development, designing and delivering a multi multitude of knowledge management based, skills based training content, as well as performance support systems for audience segments across US, Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. Finally, Cicely Smith Christensen, a Norwegian economist, expert advisor to UNESCO World Heritage Sustainable Development Program, senior advisor to the Norwegian Directorate for Cultural Heritage, and a PhD researcher at the University of Cumbria, will be our expert reactor on Facebook. But before we start, a few housekeeping tips. Please mute your microphones and perhaps maybe turn off your videos in order to reduce bandwidth requirements and prevent noise disruptions. For security reasons, we ask that you please provide your full name and affiliation so we know who you are. And we will have a Q&A session at the end, so please send your comments and questions in the chat box. Alternatively, you can watch the webinar on Facebook, on the ICOMOS International Facebook page, where our expert reactor, Cicely, can address your questions there. A quick word of gratitude to our fabulous and hardworking coordinating team, Gabe, Fatia, Roberta, Paula, Fergus, Stacy, Marie, and Eva, without whom this would not be possible. Fergus, the virtual floor is yours. Many thanks, uh, Linda, and uh, welcome to all of our ECOMOS friends and colleagues uh, who are here joining us in the presentation today. Um, and I'd like to also, as uh, Linda just did, uh, to commend my fellow uh, webinar organizers. It's a, it's a big undertaking, but I think it's really going to bear fruit in terms of some of the initiatives that are underway with regard to sustainability and dealing with the impacts of COVID at this time. So, uh, as uh, Linda mentioned, I'm the president of the Interna ECOMOS International Cultural Tourism C uh, Committee. And one of the things that we focus on as part of our work is the role that SDGs uh, play with regard to um, uh, cultural tourism. And specifically there, you'll see in my presentation that a number of goals touch upon it. Uh, there's three uh, specific targets that do touch on tourism and the cultural heritage target, but I'll get into that if the, uh, with the presentation. So uh, next slide, Linda, please. So there are, just so you know, there's a, uh, there's a number of uh, say points in terms of what is actually cultural tourism. We have it in our charter, but it's not well articulated, but I, I just drew this one from the UNWTO's AGM in uh, China three years ago. And just to read it out to you, it's a, a type of tourism activity in which the visitor's essential motivation is to learn, discover, experience, and consume the tangible and intangible cultural attractions, products in a tourism destination. These attractions, products relate to a set of distinctive material, intellectual, spiritual, and emotional features of a society that encompasses arts and architecture, historical and cultural heritage, culinary heritage, literature, music, creative industries, and the living cultures with their lifestyles, value systems, beliefs, and traditions. So 
pretty encompassing in terms of some of the extra routes that are there uh, with regard to cultural tourism and really those intangible and tangible cultural heritage elements that are really important for visitors to both experience and appreciate. And of course, the residents who live there on a the day-to-day -day basis enjoy and uh, undertake as well. Next slide, please. So, you know, it's prior to the pandemic, you know, let's be realistic. Um, over tourism was a growing concern to large historic European cities and high profile World Heritage sites. On the right, you see the Great Wall of China during Golden Week uh, two years ago. And below there's a sign in Barcelona at Park Güell overlooking the city uh, where they, you know, there have, have been real concerns about how to undertake and manage tourism at different individual sites. And you know, if there, there were already issues with tourism prior to COVID. Uh, there were concerns about significant economic leakages from destinations. I and mean, the theme of this event uh, is economic benefits from tourism. But you know, there, in terms of the money actually residing or remaining in the community, it's been an ongoing issue in a number of sectors within the tourism industry. Uh, for the visitors who live there, and again, from another economic, socioeconomic standpoint, there are increasingly unaffordable cost of living and limited housing options. It's less and less feasible for original residents to live in that place where they've been for generations where they grew up with their families. So again, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, as well, um, there's been increasing concerns about visitors' inconsiderate behavior that are affecting the quality of experience for visitors. But again, more importantly, the quality of life for locals who have to live there once the, the visitors leave. And you know, again, it's really important to remember it's. Uh, Visitors can come and go, but it's the, the residents who have to stay there and actually experience this on an ongoing basis. And finally, you know, there are a number of significant major environmental impacts that are caused by an ever expanding tourism industry where resources, uh, the sites and the ability of people to absorb tourism is finite to a degree. So next slide, please. So, this year, uh, every year, and on a monthly basis as well, the United Nations World Tourism Organization, or UNWTO, does a world tourism barometer. And in January 2020, uh, international tourism arrivals grew worldwide 4% in 2019 to 1.5 billion. This was actually down from years before, about where it'd been 5 to 6%, in part because of there were some concerns about the global economy at that time, impacts from Brexit, and a few socio-political uh, issues that were going on as well. So uh, still expanding, but there was a bit of a decrease uh, last year. Um, as well, for the upcoming year, there is a forecast of 4% growth in international tourist arrivals. And the biggest areas of growth would have been the Middle East, Asia Pacific, and Africa. And then you see, of course, uh, Europe and Americas after that. So overall, um, you know, for the Southern Hemisphere, there we're going to see the greatest growth of tourism, um, with the exception of the Americas, over the uh, the next year. Next slide, please. What really happened? Of course, the pandemic arrived upon us in March, and international tourist arrivals have dropped 65 percent during the first half of the year. In some places, it's been 90 or 95 percent because of things related to border closures. We have a border closure with the United States, for example, uh, visa restrictions. Uh, international airports being closed down. So uh, very sort of ongoing dynamic in terms of what is open and not open and accessible. Uh, this represented a loss of 440 million international arrivals and also almost half a trillion dollars in export revenues. In terms of trying to return to those 2019 visitor levels that we just discussed, there's a projection by the UNWTO that could take 2.5 to four years to return to those revenue and visitor numbers. Um, as a consequence to the impacts on the tourism industry, millions of livelihoods have been lost. And this of course is uh, subsequently affecting progress on the SDGs in terms of the people's ability to support uh, all the goals and targets that are there. And the revenue that governments have to support many of those initiatives has been redirected to propping up economies and supporting people's lives in the wake of this pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So just uh, for your reference, UNESCO has an ongoing monitor in terms of how World Heritage Sites are doing globally. And this monitor is updated on a monthly basis. And basically what they, they do is try to show uh, the greater global community what's open or partially closed. So right now, uh, uh, the partially open is in the light blue. Uh, closed, of course, are in red. And the purple or blue, depending on the screen color, are those sites that are uh, uh, that are open. So you'll note that most of the closed sites are in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, most of the open sites are in Europe, uh, some in Africa, of course, as well. And so this is, again, it's, it's an ongoing dynamic that's affecting visitation and also support for those natural and cultural sites, many of which depend upon tourism to maintain the well-being and the local visitor economies that are there. Next slide, please. So in September, the UN had a comprehensive response to COVID-19 that was uh, presented by Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. And he basically outlined five points that he would recommend to um, support the response against COVID. And specifically to mitigate the socioeconomic impacts of this crisis. Again, delving to our topic today, to build resilience across the entire tourism value chain uh, from the tourists to the hotels, to the cruise ships, to the people who supply uh, all the different aspects of the industry, as well as the labor force as well, uh, to maximize the use of technology in the tourism sector. Again, through applications of big data and Zoom and other sort of functions, we are having more of a globalized uh, merging of uh, IT and data to support various aspects of the tourism industry. Fourth, promote sustainability and green growth. Again, much of which is being sort of outlined by the SDGs and also those elements that are trying to uh, reduce the negative environmental impacts, whether it's air, water, or uh, soil quality, and improve the positive impacts, of course, of the economic benefits and the well-being of the people who live in these communities and places. And finally, to foster partnerships to enable tourism to further support the SDGs. Again, when you look at tourism, it's a broad-based industry. Many sectors are attached to it, uh, and whether it's transport, whether it's accommodation, whether it's services or amenities, all these aspects depend upon it, and there's a way to work together from different lenses to support the SDGs. Next slide, please. Now, with this going on, ECOMOS and partners are responding on a number of levels. And I just wanted to go through a few of them for your, your, your understanding in terms of what sort of approaches are being undertaken to try and address some of these concerns. Uh, the ICTC, the ECOMOS uh, International Cultural Tourism Committee, uh, we're in the process right now of, of updating the International Sustainable Cultural Tourism Charter. And one of the things we've found over the past five years in particular is we need to do more to better reflect approaches to the sustainable development goals, climate change, which are key emerging issues. And now, of course, um, aspects such as pandemics, natural disasters and conflicts, which are really, uh, you know, front and center in terms of things that are really key that we have to look at and address. There's also been uh, through the UNESCO World Heritage Center, the creation of a UNESCO Task Force on Culture, Tourism and COVID-19 that I sit on and it deals with uh, recovery, resiliency and rejuvenation. And we're working in conjunction with uh, UNESCO Advisory Board uh, uh, bodies, including ECROM, IUCN and other partners to try and formulate strategies and approaches to preserve and maintain uh, the, the livelihoods and well-being of both cultural, natural, and also mixed World Heritage Sites. As well, our partner organization, the Organization of World Heritage Cities, uh, they developed guidelines for sustainable cultural tourism. Uh, again, really well thought out and really well conceived to the European office, and it's really geared towards uh, their urban World Heritage uh, Sites uh, partners who belong to the OWHC. Finally, last uh, or last two weeks, uh, the United Nations World Tourism Organization, as part of its commemoration of World Tourism Day on September 27th, launched the Alula Framework for Inclusive Community Development Through Tourism. Again, a really thoughtful approach and more open to finding ways to support 
sustainable livelihoods in communities uh, at destination. So again, lots of things that are going on and really trying to find ways to uh, address the, the economic issues, but also the other factors that are being impacted in this time of COVID. Next slide, please. Now, when you start looking at the eventual emergence from COVID, there are a number of factors that have to be considered uh, as we move forward when, uh, if and when that recovery occurs. So specifically, uh, tourism activities will be slow to recover and it also will be among the last to restart on a phase basis. There's different de destinations have different priorities, different protocols, and this, uh, th there's a concern in terms of how you can re restart and uh, sort of move different factors forward to get tourism started again. Uh, specifically, there's a need for gradual linear lifting of travel restrictions. Many air international airports are still closed, there are visa issues, uh, quarantine protocols, etc. The availability of a vaccine or treatment. Again, a number of, uh, say, uh, clustering is going on to try and uh, ramp up and speed up the, uh, the vaccine uh, analysis and production at this point in time. And key as well for travelers is a return of visitor confidence. Again, it's a big issue, you know, you can have these testing regimes and you can have these vaccines, but again, travelers have to be confident that they can put their money down and go to a place and feel safe traveling there and knowing that they will be able to return safely as well. It should be noted as well that airlines, hotels and other parts of the visitor economy are operating at diminished capacity. Uh, many airlines right now are bleeding money uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and they're shutting down routes or having uh, less uh, connections in place just because it's a very expensive to operate airlines or cruise lines. And again, there's only so much that they can sustain on an ongoing basis. And as you know, as I mentioned at the end, segments such as cruise ships could potentially become less popular forms of conveyance and experience. Uh, some of the early images that we had uh, from Japan and the Caribbean have shown that you know people are wary now of the fact that they were trapped on board of ships and not being able to return to their home countries due to quarantine and other regulations. And there are other images uh, and other things that have come up with the cruise ship industry that hopefully will be addressed over time. But again, this is a concern with regard to their restart. Next slide, please. In terms of the SDGs, there are three specific SDGs that uh, actually are uh, targets that actually invoke or involve tourism. These are 8.9, where you promote sustainable tourism, which creates jobs for, and promotes local culture and products. Uh, target 12B, monitor sustainable development impacts for uh, sustainable tourism. So again, the reporting monitoring aspect. 14.7, increase tourism's economic benefits to small island developing states and least developed countries. And the sort of parallel one, 11.4, protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. And I also want to emphasize, and this is an important one, there should also be a strong connection to SDG 5, the goal itself, which talks about gender and sustainable development, because again, uh, a great percentage, or I think a major percentage of the tourism industry is supported by uh, female employees and workers. And this is something that really needs to be incorporated in the SDG discussion in this area. You should note that the UNWTO has created a Tourism for SDGs platform. Uh, you see the four themes are learn, share, act, and follow. And it's a very, and it's a very good resource, uh, the different aspects and case studies that can help discuss the, the different facets and aspects from the sustainability lens of tourism, where in fact, the UNWTO would argue that all 17 goals are impacted by tourism and vice versa. And so, Again, it's a it's an important and interesting lens that you can use for your tourism work and redevelopment at different destinations. Next slide, please. So, particularly in the case of sustainable tourism uh, and the SDGs, it should be noted that three years ago there was the International Year of Tourism, Sustainable Tourism for Development. This was every year, as you might know, there's a, a number of international sort of years that are focusing uh, upon different elements that are affecting society. In this case, uh, uh, it was sustainable tourism. And there are five 
key themes that the UNWTO was uh, underlining. And this includes uh, inclusive and sustainable economic growth. So again, we're talking about gender before, but there are, of course, uh, with rights-based uh, approaches, as we also have here in ECOMOS, there are other different aspects where people can participate. And this also invokes uh, social inclusiveness, employment and poverty reduction. Again, one of those aspects that are referred to in uh, the tourism field as uh, pro-poor tourism to try and reduce those poverty impacts. Uh, third, re resource efficiency, environmental protection and climate change. Again, what is tourism's role or its operational characteristics that can improve improve the efficiencies, but also at the same time, of course, reduce those negative environmental impacts. Fourth, is this, hopefully tourism can help promote cultural values, diversity and heritage, which ties into SDG 8.9, target 8.9. And finally, you know, its role in mutual understanding, peace and security, where we talked about cross-cultural communications, actually seeing people and how they live in their places of living. So again, it provides a number of functions from a sustainability standpoint. They're trying to be encouraged and also supported um, in part, hopefully by the SDGs as well. Next slide, please. So how do we address uh, challenges in cultural tourism renewal? You know, it's, it's possible to present the SDGs as a framework of interaction and inter interdependence when we're thinking a more robust uh, cultural tourism um, sector. Um, there are aspects, as with the UNWTO's approach, where the 17 goals can be interdependent and interoperable between one another uh, to support the economic, social, cultural, and environmental dimensions necessary to restart tourism. I think it's also, especially in the case of cultural tourism, to reinforce that cultural uh, that key linkage with SDG target 11.4 and to look at it in a sense that how tourism can support cultural and natural heritage protection. And finally, this is a, a, a personal concern, but I know it's been brought up by, by colleagues. Um, you need to really improve indicators alignment with tourism focused SDGs to create jobs and promote local culture and products. That's what's stated in targets 8.9 and 12B and the indicator themselves are actually how does sustainable tourism contribute to national GDP. So there's, um, you know, certainly it does that eventually, but there's a, a real sort of a lack of correlation between the actual target and the indicator that's being identified for it. So at this point in time, there is a UNWTO working group that is trying to better uh, align those indicators with the, the targets that are involved. Next slide, please. So, and there is an aspect that I'm going to recommend. I think that it's really uh, important to look at the regenerative aspects. And this is uh, an approach that's been advocated by a colleague and others, uh, but the colleague, uh, Anna Pollock, um, really trying to focus more on those different regenerative elements that are uh, uh, that are key in terms of how we think of tourism post-COVID and embedding some of those aspects that the SDGs is trying to achieve. Uh, first off, it's important to invest in community capability to imagine, develop and manage tourism. Uh, too often, you could argue that tourism is imposed on a community uh, or it develops, um, you know, in, in a way that they, they were uh, well, welcoming the initial benefits, but they didn't realize its subsequent impacts and how it affected their lives and well-being. Um, I have some examples of World Heritage Sites here in Canada where uh, sites on the tentative list are rethinking whether or not they want to be on that list because of the potential impacts of tourism on their Indigenous local cultures. Um, in terms of tourism as well, there's a need to commit to a process of learning and unlearning. Again, we have many ways of thinking of how tourism is supposed to function at a destination. Uh, and how, you know, we're supposed to generate revenue, benefits, employment, et cetera. But some of those things are negative when it comes to the economy, uh, society, the environmental impacts, and there's a need to unlearn some of those aspects and rethink the way that tourism can and should be developing. And to this end, we should define, redefine purpose, growth, and success. 
What is the purpose of tourism of that community? How do we want to have that grow in terms of a, a key economic sector there? And finally, how do we define success? What does it mean to be able to have a successful destination with the tourism that is uh, there on the ground? Uh, the fourth point is that it's important to unleash the potential that resides in people. So again, you know, uh, your community and the people who are there are your best resources. And whether it's through their, their traditions, their livelihoods, um, their capabilities, there are different ways that people can be involved in the visitor economy if they choose to do so. But again, how do you find ways that they can find an opportunity to enter into it and become a beneficiary and participant? And finally, how do we discover, celebrate, and protect the uniqueness of each place? You know, it's one of those things that drives us to different de destinations. And again, in some ways, you're seeing homogenization of some places, uh, or the artifacts or, or these important places are not being appreciated or celebrated or realized as much due to the, the, the surrounding demands of the place, like historic sites um, in an urban environment that are having pressures from uh, major suburban or infrastructural changes that are impacting the, the health and well-being of the, those sites and also the people who live there. So again, uh, how do we find a way to better celebrate and protect that uniqueness? Next slide, please. So for my last slide, you know, just to say that historic sites, cultural venues, you know, these are complex multifunctional landscapes and culture is constantly evolving. Um, you know, of course, we don't live in a vacuum and, and uh, you know, things change in terms of our ability to communicate, to travel, uh, you know, to appreciate and see different places around the world and in our own countries as well. And I think that it's important to recognize that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a one size fits all approach, especially in the case of the SDGs. Uh, it's a global framework, but you know, there's obviously local nuances and applications that make sense from one place to another. Um, second, you know, in terms of recent examples of over tourism, you know, we all, all know them in terms of, you know, Venice or Dubrovnik or uh, other places in the world. Um, all of these have indicated the need to refine destination management models, ones that both benefit the site itself and its integrity, but also the people who live there and also the communities that depend upon it. Um, you know, so to that end, I think it's really important to use a broad planning framework to address COVID tourism impact situations, and also at the same time to, reconnect, to recognize the unique circumstances of that place. There will be legislation, uh, related to planning, related to visitation, related to travel, related to health, all kinds of different factors that are there that are going to impact that site's resiliency and ability to react to those impacts from COVID. And finally, you know, look towards the SDGs and resiliency and recovery models and how to rejuvenate post-COVID local visitor economies and cultural tourism. Uh, you know, the SDGs are, yes, a very broad general-based framework, but at least there is a sense of what can and needs to be achieved in conjunction with other sectors, with other parts of the local economy. And, you know, there are ways that uh, by using a more regenerative approach, you can encourage more community participation, benefit as we emerge from COVID and are really trying to discern what that sustainability actually means at that destination or site. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Linda, that's great. Thank you so much, Fergus. That was a lot of very good information. Um, our next presentation will be a video pre-recorded presentation. We did this in order to make sure that it doesn't get interrupted by internet connectivity problems or, I don't know, power failure. So our next presentation is going, our next presentation is going to be by Larry Corbin and I am going to share it in a minute. Right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this very important session. One that I think probably reflects all of our frustration at the last 
Sorry. Good afternoon and good evening. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this very important session. One that I think probably reflects all of our frustration at the lack of centrality of culture and heritage in the sustainable development goal process, the lack of inclusion of cultural elements, the lack of understanding of cultural solutions. So in this talk, which I've called Taking Heritage Out of Its Silo to Achieve the SDGs, I wanna talk about some alternative strategies that we all might follow in order to achieve better the goals that we'd all like to do, which is to have the SDGs take place, but also have culture and heritage be a central part of that process. So I start with the report written last year, which I think you're all familiar with and was written probably by several of the people on this call, Culture and the Implementation of the 2030 Agenda. All of these quotes are from the summary of that report, and all of them relate to how culture doesn't seem to be incorporated in any significant way in the SDG process. There's a gap between existing experience and on-the-ground practices with respect to sustainable development, cultures untapped in national strategies, uh, cultures not in action and delivery, so on, and better dissemination of existing evidence and improved data, all of which I agree with totally, and I think it's important that we begin there to understand how culture has been, in fact, sidelined in the SDG process. Not by the way that the SDG process has been going all that well this time around. Estimates by economists and other analysts would suggest that we are less than 25% uh, towards achieving the sustainable development goals to date. And many of the sustainable development achievements are probably down below 10%. So I want to give you two personal examples that I've or examples that I've seen with respect to not being at the policy table for heritage people. One is an event hosted by the Rockefeller Foundation to which I was invited called 17 Rooms. It took place in 2018 and 2019 in person and uh, hopefully will be taking place virtually this year, though that's up in the air. One of the really interesting things about this is they invited 100 to 120 people to participate, uh, experts is what they called them, to sit in 17 different rooms to discuss what could be taken to jumpstart the SDG process. And you'll notice the little number five down at the bottom of my badge here, it's because there wasn't a heritage room, there were no other culture people in the room. And in fact, although we began as a heritage initiative, we were in the women's empowerment room because that's where we were seen to have done the most relevant amount of work. And the second year we were there, we were in, I think it was room one regarding alleviation of poverty, again, not related to heritage. And sadly, there were no cultural people in goal 11 or anywhere else. And none of the proposed solutions even mentioned uh, goal 11.4, which pertains, as you all know, to cultural heritage. A second example is this tweet from about a year ago by Andrew Potts, who many of you know. Andrew has done incredible, incredible work trying to pull together the relationship between climate and cultural heritage. And yet the reaction from the IPCC, Central Body Dealing with Climate Change, is that your field may be relevant. Those of you who know, actually work in government or with diplomacy know this is the way of being told you are not yet relevant at all. So for some reason, again, heritage and culture are not being part of being central with respect to these cultural elements of the development of the sustainable development goals. And going back to that report again, which states very clearly that we need parties involved in the implementation to consider culture. The answer the question really is remains, why don't they? And I'm gonna suggest a couple possible reasons and then use our experience in the, sustain in the Sustainable Preservation Initiative to talk about how we got a seat at the table at the Rockefeller Foundation, how a heritage organization or one that began with the primary goal of heritage preservation actually is now probably better known for its alleviation of poverty for women's empowerment, and as a result has been able to expand its reach all the while while maintaining heritage as 
one of its central goals of the not-for-profit work that we do. So a couple of these possible reasons would be failure to include experts from other fields, perhaps most importantly, failure to speak the language or discourse of others, an aversion to data, particularly quantitative data of the types used by people working in other fields, and a lack of engagement on a regular and serious basis with decision makers and lack of understanding of their processes. Now, I'm sure each of you probably has an example where one or more of these is wrong, but yet as a general rule, I think that they're a fair summary of the insularity that the heritage field sometimes exhibits with respect to the SDG process. So let's talk about how a heritage organization became known for women's empowerment and poverty alleviation and got a seat at the table. Uh, SPI, as I'm going to refer to it, was founded in 2011. And our premise was, if by far the leading causes of heritage destruction were economic, so must be the solutions. Which meant that we were focused on people and not the conservation of stones or monuments. And our motto remains, build futures, save paths. And therefore, that meant that sustainable economic development was as important for us as heritage preservation, and we had to be every bit as expert in it. So, we helped local community members, primarily women, establish sustainable businesses whose success was tied to site preservation and provided them a powerful incentive to do though through so through their business success. The goal was always to provide communities the tools and resources they needed to operate independently, not create a long-term presence of our organization, but instead provide the tools and resources necessary and then get out. We made it one of our watchwords that we were going to frequently measure results and have incredibly strong and powerful metrics and that a significant portion of our budget had to be dedicated to that. And our board members reflected the diverse experiences and expertises that we needed. So it includes archeologists, diplomats, business people, reporters, business school professors, a very broad range of relevant skills. To date, we have 20 projects in six countries, and we do a constant improvement of our model based on metrics and analysis, learning from both our successes and our failures. And yes, we have three failed projects, and you can read about them on our webpage, but we think, well, it's, we don't like the idea of embracing failure. We certainly all need to know about it and to talk about it. And we learned that community development did enhance preservation, where there were successful projects, looting and site invasions essentially stopped. And we also learned that we had to constantly improve the capacity building program for the business, for the women entrepreneurs that we were helping, because that made for stronger and more resilient businesses. So we learned that the programs needed to teach broad business skills, not just how to make pretty things. We learned that the optimal program duration was close to a year with roughly three hours of classes per week, though that varies somewhat by cultural context. And the frequency of timing and meetings need to be tailored culturally to local context. In exceptionally macho places, if you're trying to reach women, you can't simply have your coursework run eight hours a day, five days a week, it will not work. We also noted that practicing and mentoring, not just coursework, was critical to success. People needed to go back, try these things in their small businesses and be able to come back and talk to us about what worked and what didn't and test their own understanding. So let me give you, because I am a big believer in data, as I've mentioned, a case study. The magnificent pilgrimage site of Pachacamac, located just outside of Lima, Peru. And as you can see, uh, the city of Lima is now expanding right up onto the site's borders, and there's been enormous, enormous incidences of uh, site invasion, people trying to take over land, build houses on the site. So a cooperative there in conjunction with the museum was formed by SPI of 24 women from the three communities around the site, and they completed the SPI capacity building program, establishing a business selling souvenirs, they also created, as a result of their own organization chart, which by the way, when we would show it to donors was an extraordinary fundraising tool. They created their own governments and management structures, etc. Each person had a specific role in the division of labor. They've had extraordinary economic success, as you can see in the chart on the right, 
and looting and site invasion has ceased. I show you this chart again, A, because this is an extraordinary economic result. That's you know, 500 times sales growth in a period of five years for a startup business. But it also shows you the depth to which we collect metrics on a long-term, ongoing basis. And we have a lot more metrics behind this that would support these sales figures. We have profitability figures. We have by product. We have types of products. We have seasonality. The point being that we are really tailoring our programs constantly so the next ones are better and better, as well as the ability for these businesses to learn to analyze themselves. What we realized after several successful projects like the one that I just showed you is that we needed to standardize this curriculum in order to scale. We needed to standardize the lesson plans with of course the ability to appropriately adjust them for cultural context. The other thing that happened almost simultaneously with that is our successes began to attract the attention of non-heritage governmental and NGO entities interested in the SDGs. People like the Rockefeller Foundation, as I showed you, UNOPS, part of the UN, the city of Lima, and many, many more. And they were particularly interested in the contribution that we could make to goals one, four, five, eight, and 10, though again, sadly, not 11.4. So we've now standardized this curriculum. It exists in both English and Spanish. It regards 40 to 45 hours of coursework, along with practice and mentoring. It's taught in modules that best address the need of participants and can be tailored to local cultures, literacy levels, and actual business needs. And you can see we divide it with these uh, icons into eight basic sections, and there's 40 to 45 hours of coursework that are modifiable. Uh, we then decided to take that curriculum and actually form a newly branded business school, again, not for profit, for poor women and other marginalized entrepreneurs that would utilize this SPI curriculum. That business school is called Escala, which is the Spanish word for ladder and stands for, has an acronym there which you can see, which is Business School for the Conservation and Advancement of Latin America, founded in 2020, 2019, excuse me. Some of these business schools are located at or near or have associations with heritage sites, but now we're actually doing others that do not. These business schools also much reduced the dependency on tourism, which was a weakness we had identified in our earlier paradigm as we really couldn't address site preservation at sites that didn't have touristic traffic. One of our biggest uh, partners is the city of Lima. They help us recruit, they give us facilities in which to conduct classes, etc. And most of our financial support is now coming from non-heritage related sources. This business school, which began in person, has accelerated, we've accelerated the transition to online learning, originally planned in 2022, due to COVID-19, and we are now delivering this program entirely online in Peru. Uh, this was an extraordinary learning process for us, where we had to bring another set of experts in, with experts in, who with online learning experience, in order to accelerate this transition and be able to continue to deliver the results that we do. As a result, we now have 60 graduates of Escala with another 150 who are currently engaged in coursework. The following feedback was provided from the first graduating class, which I think demonstrates well the success of the program. 100% of the participants said they improved the way they manage their business. 84% of the participants improved their business and personal finances. 85% of the participants were calculating fixed costs by the end of the program, as compared to 10% of the participants at the beginning of the program. It's still too early for us to have sales data and in the, even, in the era of COVID it will be difficult to compare, but we look forward to doing quantitative analysis with respect to revenues and profitabilities for many of these businesses to truly measure the efficacy of the business school program as well as we are adding a series of quizzes to the program to see whether participants perception of how they are improving matches their actual grasp of the knowledge i show you this page which shows that the participants are improving their understanding of the goal setting process this is the kind of deep dive analysis that we do and this is the kind of analysis that people working in sustainable development expect and we have Power, PowerPoint slides like this. We have 30 of them, but there are 30 different metrics that we collect 
so we can stand as heritage people in a sustainable development room and no one will think that we are any less qualified to talk about sustainable development than the others. It's taken us a long time to develop this expertise. We've brought a lot of different kinds of people to bear. My partner is an incredible powerhouse woman named Maureen Miskovich. Her last job was chief risk officer of UBS, the Swiss bank. When she stands up and talks about these things, people truly listen. We were also, because of the business school, able to have a rapid COVID response. Resiliency was always part of our curriculum, but with COVID-19, we expanded and emphasized that. As a result, 77% of the students are now using online sales platforms and accepting digital payments. 53% began offering some sort of delivery service to adapt to local quarantine restrictions. 50% of those involved with textiles added mask making to their business, and we have beautiful masks. You can see them on our webpage. Ceramicists added soap dishes and sanitizer holders to their businesses. You can also see those. And no businesses have failed in spite of the quarantine restrictions. We think this is an extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary result that reflects the fact that we have considered this as much about business as it is about heritage. And here you can see a very, very happy set of graduates from uh, our first graduation ceremony in the museum at Pachacama. So let me wrap up by saying that it is possible for a heritage conceived program to move into the mainstream of SDG goal achievement and powerfully demonstrate the resonance of culturally based solutions. By speaking the language and utilizing the metrics of sustainable development, others were quickly able to understand the relevance and efficacy of our program. And as a result, our program will influence or be adopted by a broader set of policymakers. Bringing diverse skill sets to bear was critical to our success. We have a seat at the table now, which will be to the benefit of women, poor communities, and heritage. And we hope you'll work with us in the future so that we can have more seats at the cultural heritage table. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Larry is here and he will be addressing your questions in person. Um, our next presenter is Pankaj Manchanda, and he will be sharing his mm, slides himself. Greetings, everyone. All right, thank you everyone. Greetings from India. The presentations uh, made by Fergus and Nari have been very enriching and I've been taking some notes for myself. Anyhow, maybe Larry, I could reach out to you after the webinar to get some best practices, especially on the SPI's capability development module. Without further ado, I will now share with you about Oc Traveler, which is a startup project use case in the heritage culture, travel tech space that primarily aligns to UN SDGs 11, 8, and 4. Right. So uh, yeah, it all started, you know, with my travels outside the country and within India as well, uh, either for business or for leisure. And uh, as one can relate to it, whenever you're exploring a new place, invariably, most of the times, you would start with the history of the place, its heritage sites and museums, etc. So we figured that the kind of interpretation of the heritage sites and museums that you get in the West is like to totally the next level. And even more so, they tend to market these experiences um, in a very interesting way. And that got us to think, you know, there's so much more in India the rich heritage, the culture, uh, the history. And despite the scale 
and the grandeur of the heritage sites, they actually lack authentic, accurate interpretations for visitors in their vernacular languages. So for most of you who've been to India, uh, you would actually relate to it that when you approach a monument or a heritage site, you'll be hunted by those tour guides. Now most of them would not be really skilled or certified. And even if you end up hiring a tour guide, rest be assured that you'll get healthy doses of fictitious information just because they would want to make your experience very interesting. Now, that having said that, we said that if that's a big problem, what are the other things that you really get at the heritage site in India? And some of the sites would have those audio guides, the hardware, the black hardware devices that you get, and which we figured were not really scalable. And uh, despite the uh, hygiene issues of the, of the ear pads, uh, there are also pilferage issues, maintenance, charging, so that's a kind of a deterrent. And then we figured that if that was the case with the audio guides, uh, there were some new kind of technology evolving with audio apps. Uh, most of them we evaluated uh, really had fantastic production quality, but the co content coverage in that context was not really as deep as one would like. Right? So, so more so these apps were, we feel, we, we believe that were already designed for a niche audience because the language used in their narration clearly required a higher level of proficiency and therefore it was not for the masters. Now coming from the education learning space, we do understand that when you're curating content, it really has to be the, the, the complexity of the language that you really incorporate should not be more than an eighth grader or a ninth grader. So, so, so with these kind of challenges or problems, we approached the good offices of Archaeological Survey of India. And he said, you know, we come with this background of education, we understand technology, we could idly use your archives to, to really curate experiences for our world heritage sites, right? And if you could give us access to the sites for our video shoots, photo shoots, that would help as well. So, so the ASI said, you know what, this, we, we have relatively open archives, have a look at it. And, and see what you can do with it. And we like the idea. So that's that was our starting point. And, and when we started to curate content from ASI archives, we figured that the content that they had was more technical in nature. So if you were to address a kind of an audience segments, which were students or, or even travelers, they wouldn't really appreciate the technicality of the content. So on a parallel track, we approached institutions such as Intac, uh, in Delhi and other chapters of Intac in India and of course the UNESCO office in Delhi uh, for support and UNESCO office in Delhi was really gracious in getting us support uh, by introducing us to their knowledge partners who were creating dossiers for the World Heritage Sites and uh, some of them are now our knowledge partners so that really helped uh, so, so that basically also took care of one of the big problem statements of really getting authentic accurate content to be curated for the larger audiences and some of our uh, knowledge partners now include uh, we say the drona foundation in india being instrumental in getting the heritage track for jaipur city we have world monument fund this professor barry perles at cornell university ecomos sdg working group is also our partners in they appreciate helped us you know get our mandates aligned to the sdg goals there's global heritage fund there's macmillan education and culture center and all so that really took care of it. now moving on to the next two spokes um, you know when you've actually been through the built heritage also if you can relate it from your own experience in exploring a new place uh, you would want to then explore the local flavor of the region right and when you talk about the local flavor it could be through its art um, its craft the culinary delights the music the festivals all of that rituals really come in play and we believe that the local communities uh, are, play have a very important role in that context, right? And they are um, invariably the custodians for the rich cultural heritage of any region, if we are to offer an immersive experience to the travelers. Now, these communities, we figured, need to be an integral part of the ecosystem and should be onboarded onto the platform. So what we figured was that in most cases, the, the tourism dollars were not really reaching the host communities. 
uh, uh, they're seldom compensated fairly for their traditional authentic products and services. They're often procured by the local businesses at very cheap cost and sold at huge profits. Now, with, with what, what, what we also understood that with the lack of a sustainable economic uh, viability in, in the tourism model, many artisans or communities are now moving away from the traditional arts and crafts to more mass produced goods. Now, this is resulting in uh, diminishing or dilution of the authentic intangible cultural heritage of the region. So, so our roadmap on our traveler really enables that we, we curate a, a specific heritage walks and trails and uh, it, it uses geolocation, augmented reality and gives you a very personalized uh, experience. And while you're walking on a trail, we geotag the community businesses and we also offer the community an online marketplace uh, where they can actually push their products or services which are unique to their region. So, so the, in, the idea here is that we're trying to promote and therefore preserve the intangible cultural heritage and we are dovetailing into a sustainable livelihood program um, uh, by, by aligning itself to the tourism mandates or the rural tourism um, aspects. Uh, the third spoke here is, uh, is a school outreach program that we have. Um, coming from ethics, we couldn't have really let it go. So we have this very interesting tie-up with Macmillan Education where we are evolving an interesting twist to our heritage site um, and, and it, it, you know, converting it to, into, into a knowledge dissemination zone rather than being just a picnic spot or a photo opportunity. So I could share a bit more later in this, uh, in this session. Uh, this is the first part of what what we're trying to do or how we're trying to make heritage and culture accessible to all then certain videos i'll specifically play one video which essentially post covid uh, uh, you know highlights how the augmented reality aspects or interactions are really playing out and and what we did specifically in this context was uh, uh, most of the uh, ar uh, interactivities were initially um, geofenced to a heritage site so you had to be at the site to really uh, you know, experience it. But uh, post COVID, we've actually unlocked all these experiences. So you can actually now uh, play out an AR interaction at, at your own location. And this is also aligned to the 11.4 SDG goal. And a very premise, the experience has multimedia synchronization here with audio in vernacular languages. The air layer is only on top of it. Uh, the current video will only highlight the AR aspects. So I'm not too sure if the audio is playing for you, but uh, this is how we try to play out uh, the Kutub complex in Delhi. And there's a Kutub Minar, which is, and then we've also tried to build the Alai Minar, which as per the historical records was never built. It's, it's partially complete for those who've been to the complex, and it gives a kind of a inherent narration to the, to, to the site. Uh, this is the Jantar Mantra in Jaipur, the observatory, which is uh, uh, still functioning. Um, um, here we're talking about the Samrat Yantra and it says that, you know, how does it look at the top and you enter a portal window and you can actually be at the top of the Yantra and see around. And these kind of strategies can be used in, in many ways, which I'll explain later. Uh, this is the Rashi Balaya Yantra or the Zodiac signs, which really, uh, you know, is, enhances the experience of the traveler specifically as uh, depending on your Zodiac sign, what is your lucky color, lucky dates. Uh, lucky stones, all of that. Uh, this is the sundial again, and we have interaction simulations played out here. So uh, in different times of the day, you can actually click and see how the clock really moves. Uh, this is again the, uh, another instrument which is working. So we have the southern clock and the winter clock uh, uh, in, in its context. And you can see how basis the sun's movement, you can actually see the clock. Uh, the functionality of the clock. This is uh, the Hava Mail in Jaipur again. So we talk about uh, the, the physics concept of venturi effect in here, where uh, how the hot air really loses temperature while it flows through the narrow niches of the windows. And yeah.
So this is the Amir Fort here. We basically played out a model of uh, a section of Amir Fort where we talk about how water was stored and drawn in from the lake below. So there's a pulley system and how it really works. And then there is a Persian water wheel at the, at the rear end of the palace walls. And you can actually go in and obviously this is a 3D model which you can play around with. And, but it highlights the nuances uh, in that context. Uh, this is for more more uh, touristy kind of an AR feature. So this is again uh, kind of a marble uh, stone inlay work, and and the the guides they are actually uh, you know interpreted in different ways. This is the largest cannon in the world, uh, so we put it uh, you know in your neighborhood. Right, so I think this will give you an idea. I will not play the other videos in this section, uh, but moving on, uh, we also, uh, in COVID times, uh, uh, you know, documenting museums, uh, museum spaces was another part of our roadmap, which got speed tracked because, uh, 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 you know, uh, the restricted travel times and people wanted to visit museums. So we got, we did a small pilot for Rajasthan government in, in India. And uh, it also uh, highlights and uh, on, on the mandate of accessible tourism aligned, uh, you know, broadly with SDG 10. I'll just play this uh, video here again. What we tried to do differently in this one was again using technology instead of a traditional 360 shoot, we uh, utilize a 3D scanning methodology, infrared 3D scanning mechanism. Uh, why we did that also was that in a traditional 360 output you get a fisheye kind of a curvature to an image which really distorts the artifacts um, of a museum. So we wanted it to be, uh, you know, um, played out uh, very uh, effectively and efficiently uh, as in one would want to visit it virtually then it should not really, uh, come, uh, you know, uh, disrupt the entire experience in some way. And then definitely these are interactions that we played out for each of the artifacts. And, and you can see how we, the movement really evolves. It's very different from a traditional 360 shoot. Um, I think you would have gotten kind of an idea, so I'll just move ahead. Uh, moving to the next uh, mandate of uh, really um, evolving the ge geolocation and AR enabled personal trails. Uh, we, we, we we basically tried to evolve these trails around the built heritage, right? Where we onboarded the communities and the, the events, the concerts are part of the calendar widget that we already have in the platform. There are experiences uh, such as art painting, sculpture, culinary, which is whichever is specific to a region. So the community actually gets onboarded in this entire uh, gamut of our scope. Uh, this particular uh, use case is is uh, at Chokri Modi Khana in Jaipur, which is again in, in, in the UNESCO World City. And uh, like you see here, we have geolocation-based narration in vernacular language. This is a custom path that we created. And what we tried to do here is that we tried to onboard the traditional tatera or the traditional brass bits or copper bits uh, in this in this experience. So we wanted to highlight really their art, their craft the nuances of the of what they do and how they do it. Um, this specific Tatera or Rasmid really talks about, you know, his forefathers were uh, were involved in engaged in building finials for the Hawa Mel. Now for the visitor, what is a finial? So you can actually build a finial in AR and see uh, how it, it functions as an, as an architectural device. So these were the kind of AR features uh, that we built in. Uh, definitely in the path, there were some more triggers, so I'll play some more videos here. Uh, like this is a, a, a very interesting way of uh, highlighting a typical day in the life of a Tatera and what is the kind of an output that they really create and what, what really, how much hard work it really goes into building their, their, their art form. So in an implicit level, we are trying to really uh, build an appreciation and acknowledgement for the visitors on the, on the local craft. Uh, in that process, we are also urging the visitors to, to really, they, they want to buy any souvenirs or artifacts rather than going out in, in the main market and buying it at a higher cost. 
they can actually buy directly from the community. So this is how we align it to 8.9. And then we urge them that extend your support uh, to preserve and promote the heritage and buy authentic artifacts directly from the place. So uh, this is another video uh, which also builds on the narrative of uh, what are the challenges that this community is really you know, facing in the current day and age. So these are actual Tadera's who we interviewed and these guys say that we don't want our future generations to be working on this trade. They're facing stiff competition from the steel industry and obviously the local businesses don't compensate them enough. So all those nuances really come in play. It, it actually again feeds into the to the system of uh, you know urging the visitors to, to to really help this community by buying stuff directly from them. So this is how they say we don't want our kids to be working on this. Yeah, so this probably gives you kind of help. Moving on, uh, like I said, uh, we also have a, a component of an online curated marketplace where the community can actually push forth their handicrafts, handlooms, artifacts, culinary, uh, you know, delights or homestays, all of that on onto this platform. The, uh, since we're looking at a sustainable livelihood model evolving out of this entire mandate, then we don't really want the communities to be dependent on a, on a tourism cycle or a season. Uh, if you've been to a place, you bought something as a visitor and you like it, then you can order it online again. So that's how we are trying to evolve this. And obviously coming in from the education training space, we, we do understand that, you know, uh, if you are able to generate this kind of a demand for the community to build more traditional uh, products or artifacts, then there will be a, a component of capacity development, which really should come in play, which is where we have our partnership with some other uh, industry bodies uh, like FIKI as ADF in India, which is an industry body and they have this uh, programs on Jivika, uh, which is sustainable livelihoods. So we have partnered with them. They have a kind of entire module on capacity development. They are experts there working with local communities and local players. So, so we're dovetailing into them with this kind of mandate. Uh, interestingly, uh, this specific uh, work that we did has also been now documented in the in the UNESCO Creative Cities report. Moving on, uh, uh, specifically in context to COVID-19 action plan, and we understand that, you know, travel uh, restrictions have, have really severely impacted the entire ecosystem. So what we are now trying to do is we're trying to open up the off traveler platform to the local community businesses to a, in the vicinity of a site. And these really are uh, uh, smaller businesses which come from the community and do the, they do their typical immersive experiences or a heritage walk. So the platform will really enable them to author and build their own walks and trails on our traveler and publish it under their own business and name. So the idea is to give them a kind of a digital competence and scale uh, while the travel industry is getting is, is, in, is under this impact, right? And uh, what we are also urging them, uh, obviously, how this model is uh, supposed to evolve is that they need to collaborate and co-create uh, immersive curated travel experiences with the local communities because that's what they they understand the community, the cultural ecosystem very well. So, so the idea is to really dovetail into that, and then they can also help the, uh, onboard these communities to, to to really upload their unique products and services on the marketplace. And, and what we provide to them is despite, the, uh, uh, of course, we provide them a digital platform, but we also provide them assistance from our knowledge partner pool for curation of authentic heritage trails and experiences, right? We also provide to them assistance for market outreach via our existing business partner ecosystem that we are evolving, which probably will give them a more predictable revenue generation pipe um, uh, that will also help in a way motivate the communities and local players to build new trails as well 
because you know um, um, right now what what we also perceive is that all these uh, local businesses follow the same path the same route so they have only the set kind of tourist uh, circuits right so with the digital scale they can actually be motivated to get into new trails and that could solve the problem of over tourism in some way and also uh, on a parallel track curate new experiences because you know prior to covid what we understood is that these guys used to take uh, people out 8 10 12 people on a heritage walk but now with all their walks uh, getting a digital uh, kind of a footprint they'll have more time which is where they will collaborate co-create these more immersive experiences uh, and move up the value chain so it could be a cookery class or a pottery making or a yoga class all of that really moves in. and that probably should also link into sdgs 11 uh, 1 and then uh, obviously 8.9 we're focusing so 12b is, is where we're going to be impacting uh moving on to do to the school segment uh obviously coming in from education side we couldn't have really let it go and uh, one of the reasons or the triggers to start this was that, uh, you know, I have a 12 year old and she, she used to get conflicting messages in the classroom, specifically with the tour guides giving those <laughs> interesting stories. She used to say, you know, my teacher is wrong. So so, um, so what we're trying to do now is that with, with Macmillan Education, which is one of the premier publishers in India, we've created a multidisciplinary activity book. Uh, and when I say multidisciplinary, I mean that it has folks into mathematics, geometry, ICT, history, of course, English, all of that really come into play. And the premise is the world heritage site. So uh, while they develop this appreciation, acknowledgement of the rich culture and heritage, um, they also get to, to apply their knowledge on the concepts that they pick up in school. So for instance, uh, if we talk about the Kutub complex in Delhi, and we talk about the iron pillar not rusting, then the concept of metallurgy comes in play. If you talk about domes and squinches, geometry comes in play. If you talk about the argument going green, yellow, air quality index comes in play. So whatever concepts the kids are really picking up at school, they get to apply that at the site. So they have an activity book, which is experiential learning pedagogy based. There's a relevant app experience. There are some videos which support the activities. So that's how it is evolving. Uh, these are some of our knowledge partners and supporters who have been uh, helping us in evolving this roadmap. Uh, I'll move next. Uh, this is uh, one of the use cases uh, with uh, UNESCO Parzor. Uh, we're trying to, um, uh, it's, this is a Parsi Zoroastrian project which intends to generate awareness on, on this, uh, you know, so called minuscule minority uh, and, and create a revival of interest within the community, country, and the world. So that's what we are trying to do with this, with Off Traveler, um, and, and bring, bring in trails to trace, which traces the history of Zoroastrian religion in India. Uh, these are some of our industry partners uh, uh, and I'll talk more about uh, say TripAdvisor here. So um, what we try to do with our business industry associations is that we try to marry the visitor experience along with how it can help our broader mandate of helping communities, right? So while we can provide, so these are screens from our traveler. So we, we actually provide the rating and promote sites as top things to do in a city. We have nearby content of TripAdvisor on our traveler, which provides the top bubble rated, you know, experiences or the hidden gems. And while we do our uh, heritage walks here, we, we also have to uh, provide the geotagged community businesses that we do as part of our curation back to TripAdvisor so that they can actually populate it onto their maps so that even if people are not using our traveler app uh, these artisan workshops or local culinary shops still get highlighted on TripAdvisor which has a larger footprint and stickiness with the users and travelers across the globe about uh, a top bubble rated you know experience in the vicinity if they're in that region yeah so these are that's about it. I think uh, that's where we are. Thank you so much, Linda. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. We've enjoyed all the presentations so far. We've had really good questions uh, on Zoom and in Facebook. Uh, we're going to start off with Graham Bell. If you would like to unmute and ask your question, we'd appreciate it. 
Thank you very much. Um, obviously, we're short of time, so I'll just read the question that I posed, which is, hello, Fergus, lots of good data, thank you. As a board member of Europa Nostra, I'm involved in a European sustainable tourism project called Impact Tour, aiming to help management in disadvantaged or marginalised locations, which usually means they are under-resourced. How can such locations tap into what you're describing and benefit? Um, thanks for your question, Graham. And I, I really, I've, I've, I know of the work of Europa Nostra, and I really appreciate the work that you and your colleagues do in this uh, in, the, in this domain. Um, certainly, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned specifically World Heritage, but as per one of the other comments that I'd seen along the the the, uh, the chat room, it's. 11.4, for example, it, it, it talks about the overall heritage and the overall intangible heritage. And I think especially, you know, in Europe, there are things such as cultural roots. I know in some uh, countries, they've tried to find ways to spread the benefit or wealth of tourism, if you will, uh, through travel between destinations or places or place to place. Um, the, the, the challenge right now is, of course, we cannot travel from place to place and there are restrictions, especially going across borders uh, between some countries. But, you know, there are definitely um, opportunities out there. And if you like, I'd be happy to uh, share my email and uh, if you, we can discuss this further independently if you'd like to do so. Definitely. Thank you. Linda, you're muted. Technology. Fatiha, would you like to ask the next question, please? Hello. So we got another one for our group. It's from Fazal Abdurrahman. He thank Dr. Fargood for such a great presentation and uh, requested for some advice. Hello, Faisal sure. there. Yeah, I'm here. What sort of advice would he what do you what do you like? Hi. Faisal, are you there? So he's basically asking uh, they're activating a national cultural tourism committee. So probably something on that. Okay. Sorry, do they? I'm not getting what the question is. I, I believe, uh, Fergus, the um, Faisal Abraman just wants to uh, get your um, information if they want to create a national cultural tourism committee in their Ecomus Malaysia, and how okay. do they get in touch with you for the national committee, the scientific committee? Okay, uh, thanks for clarif clarifying that. Um, yes, no, I'm very familiar with Malaysia. In fact, it's one of my favorite countries in the world. So I'll put that out there as a plug. But um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share my email. And um, I think that, um, you know, we have a number of countries that have developed uh, national cultural tourism committees. Uh, Norway is a very good example, well led, of course. And then there's uh, Colombia, India, and a number of countries have established their own national cultural tourism committees. And certainly we have a number, I think we have three uh, ICTC members from Mickey Mouse Malaysia. So again, you have a good core to work with. Um, I'll, I'll uh, send you my email and then uh, you're welcome to uh, connect with me and we'll see how we can help you out. Thank you so very much. I believe we have another question from Dennis Rodwell. Dennis, would you like to unmute your microphone? Okay, um, yes, well, uh, I've, I've been involved in this game for a long time, including in the discussions that took place um, before the SDGs were announced. And I strongly uh, put forward the notion that inclusive ideas of what concept, what, what culture mean and what heritage mean were imperative. Um, and uh, because that would be the cement that would join together all of the uh, 17 goals as they are now. 
Um, and I find it disappointing that we're still in silos, um, where 11.4 is ambiguously worded as the world's cultural and natural heritage, to the point where many people are assuming it is just world with a capital W. Um, and this was rather implicit in one of uh, Fergus's slides where he was illustrating world heritage sites. And I think we have a basic problem. Um, I've also been involved with um, European Capitals of Culture where, for example, Turku in Finland, they promoted the culture of work. In Liverpool, they promoted the culture of football and popular music. Uh, I was involved in very early discussions in Plovdiv, which is this year's or last year's um, capital of culture, Bulgaria. And I provocatively suggested in front of a group of, of archaeologists that they had to include the large Roma community of the city in. I got shock horror response, but it was put into their bid and it actually succeeded in them getting the cultural cult, um, uh, uh, European um, capital of culture because they'd included a minority community which had not rec been recognized by the archaeologists as having any culture, let alone any heritage. So this question of definitions, silos, um, policies, all the rest of it, which narrow culture down to something which is exclusive, um, is contradictory to my understanding of the potential of the Sustainable Development Goals. Larry, would you like to address that? Sure. Happy to. I mean, I, I look, I think the focus has to be squarely upon people. I think the notion of heritage as defined has become awfully, you know, both intangible and tangible, but also devoid of the notion of interaction with people to a great extent and perhaps a touristic brand. So, I mean, I'm a big believer, obviously, in de-siloization and you know, we've tried not to do that because I don't think you can have a successful, uh, I don't think the problem is definitional. I think the problem is culture, the cultures of the respective different fields in which people are functioning and it's a natural siloization that people need to work hard to break out of. Thank you so much. We have one more question on Facebook and that is for Pankaj and that's on contested heritage. Uh, uh, two questions about the Ark Traveler. One is, will the narrative support contested heritage if there are different narratives, be available on the same app? And what language is used on the app? Does it also come in different dialects, for instance? So, so the perspective here is that the different interpretations to history and the idea of really aligning with our knowledge partners was to really provide uh, the most acceptable, uh, you know, interpretation of history. But what we've also tried to take care in this context is that there are different points of view while you're interpreting, you know, historical narratives. So uh, wherever possible, we are trying our best to provide all the points of views in context of, uh, of a heritage site or a culture in that context. Uh, so that was uh, part one. Uh, but could you please repeat the second question again? Uh, dialects? Yeah, the, so, so the idea is to basically offer uh, the experience in different languages and uh, a digital platform really enables that. Um, so we have uh, at this time uh, experiences available in English, uh, which is the Indian dialect and diction, and there is a Korean version to it because uh, with our partnership with the Korean embassy, whatever uh, nuances that we are evolving in English language, they get to do it in Korean and extend it to the Korean audience. Obviously, uh, we've done some of other experiences which we'll be, uh, you know, putting it on. Uh, it, it's the Spanish version for for Taj Mahal and there are some Indian word uh, languages that we are introducing slowly. So it depends on on, on the kind of it, uh, feedback that we're also getting from the industry partners of what kind of languages need to be introduced. So that can be done easily. Thank you so very much. I'm aware of the time, so I will now give the floor to Ege for final wrap up. 
And I do hope that you join us for our next webinars that we will um, advertise on Facebook and LinkedIn. Right. So thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, our presenters, um, Fergus, Larry, Pankaj, and everyone who's with us today. So um, I'm tasked with uh, giving a few uh, concluding uh, remarks to um, summarize perhaps some key points um, as the SDGs focal point of ECOMOS today. Um, and it, it's actually uh, very uh, hard to see the response to these webinars. And we, I think it's a great platform to share ideas. So I'd like to just uh, highlight uh, a few things that came up in all three presenters, really. Uh, the theme of uh, this particular webinar we um, named as prosperity um, or the, uh, the economic dimension. Uh, this is one of the f uh, three pillars, the, uh, the triple bottom line of, the, of sustainable development, but also part of the five P's of the 2030 agenda. So this would be people, planet, prosperity, partnerships and peace. And um, while we uh, departed from the pillar of prosperity, I think we quickly arrived at the pillar of people. People is inevitable. It, it stands in the center of our work increasingly. Um, and uh, when we're talking about economic empowerment or resources, it's also a matter of human resources, investing in people, um, tapping into their hidden potential, empowering them. Uh, so I think education and capacity building are an important part of this. Uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 response, um, travel is one of the most obviously hit areas in our lives. I mean, I think we are all complaining about uh, our lack of Mo uh, sorry, there's another uh, sound there. Should I wait? Uh, right, okay. Um, so we're all um, suffering from our uh, lack of mobility on travel and uh, that translates easily to tourism. And um, I think it's very meaningful to follow the developments in the tourism response in terms of the world's COVID response. And it seems uh, from Fergus's um, well-informed um, um, position in the UNESCO ECOMOS uh, sphere, the uh, international framework is uh, very well developed. Uh, so we have uh, the frameworks and the guidance from there, uh, which is a valuable uh, given for us. Uh, but then um, both SPI and Pankaj gave us uh, some of the uh, potentials of uh, how examples on the ground, the tangible case studies, what's really uh, to be done um, actively. Uh, these are very powerful examples for us uh, to reflect on and um, learn from, I, I would say, especially how SPI um, really um, reaches out and empowers people because material terms how we make money um, that bottom line that does need to be addressed while taking in care of all the other components of our life silo breaking um, all the while of course and also um, our traveler shows us the uh, power of visuals, uh, digital platforms. That's the, the way of the future. So harnessing these tools and uh, localizing them by diversifying them into local languages and uh, uh, alternatives and narratives um, available. Um, again, empowering schools and uh, also leveraging partnerships. Again, great examples of silo breaking. Um, so I would like to um, just um, express our appreciation for, for you to share all of this. Um, oh, one other point, um, I think you, the diversification, not being tourism dependent only. It's a little bit like um, not putting all your eggs in the same basket. Um, it's just a very um, rule of thumb of risk management perhaps and resiliency. So I think tourism has to be very well positioned in terms of this diversification. Um, so. In wrapping up um, and expressing our thanks to you um, um, he, to be here, um, I also wanted to um, tie in from Linda's um, uh, no, no, notifying us of the International Day of Poverty Alleviation, very meaningful, nice uh, um, serendipity we have here. Um, I'd like to go back to our uh, webinar series in general. Uh, we started uh, a few weeks ago with webinar one um, on SDG 11 and, and the local, uh, the city's goal and the local uh, level. And we um, actually, I should reiterate that we are in urban October still. From the 1st of and to, to, to the 31st of October, UN Habitat has a great advocacy campaign um, about um, 
sustainable urbanism. So um, I think I can invite everybody here to um, connect uh, their practices into what it means for sustainable co um, cities, communities and human settlements at the same time. Uh, follow uh, the online media, social media websites for Urban October uh, and the 40 Day City Challenge for arts and culture innovation for safer cities as well. Um, so in closing, um, I would like to put on my little mask, which was uh, produced by the ladies in the bazaar where, um, at the site where I'm working as heritage manager. Uh, it's made from cotton, the best one I have. So we're following the steps of SPI, Larry. I think we're on the right track. So a uh, good day to everybody. Stay safe and take care. See you soon.